Um, in this presentation, I'll, I'll briefly go over a couple of projects in my group that relate to this theme of learning the structure and function of objects. Uh, in this, uh, you know, this, uh, many of our daily activities involve interactions between humans and objects, and in fact, a lot of man-made objects are built to support these interactions. For example, they have handles like the pan that you see, and uh, so objects are designed with functional parts to support interactions with humans, and the idea of this effort is if we can understand and encode in digital form this structure of objects that relate to their function and the actual interactions they have with humans, then we can do a number of tasks better, we can do better action prediction and recognition in images and videos, we can do better virtual and augmented reality, and we can build better robots that assist humans. So in this talk, I'm going to take an object-centric point of view to machine learning. It will be 3D based because I believe that among all the representations we have of objects, uh, 3D is the one that is the closest to the physical artifact. So as compared to images, 3D is free of detractors like you know, background, clutter, and occlusions. It also gives us a whole view of the object, not just one side of it. So this talk is a combination of uh, machine learning, computer vision, and computer graphics. Computer graphics, not only because of 3D, but also because I strongly believe that to understand something means to be able to create it. So part of this talk will focus on synthesis, synthesis of objects and synthesis of interactions of humans with objects. So that's, that's where we are going. Uh, one uh, effort in my group that's been going on now for a few years is the creation of this ShapeNet repository of 3D objects. This is mostly everyday objects, things like tables and chairs and cars and aeroplanes and bicycles and forks and knives and lamps and so on. And what's interesting about ShapeNet is it doesn't just try to represent the 3D geometry, but to represent the semantics of this object, to represent information about their structure, their parts, their symmetries, their materials, their appearance, and more and more their functionality. And it's a live repository that's been used already by hundreds of research groups across the world for many things, for example, to create synthetic data for training computer vision algorithms. And that's a picture of what you see when you go to ShapeNet today. And I welcome you to, uh, you know, to visit the website and start exploring the 3D models that we have there. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to focus quite a bit on object parts because uh, these are important for the structure of objects. And uh, also the state of objects, that is, um, when it comes to using objects, often the goal is to put an object in a given state. So I show here examples where you may have images of the same object, say a chair, a door, a cup. But between the left and the right, the state is different. It matters whether the chair is empty or occupied. It matters whether the door is open or closed. It matters whether the cup is empty or full. And so part of our goal here has been to be aware of, detect the state of objects, and be able to take actions that put objects in a desired state. Uh, I'll be very interested in how humans interact with objects and exactly how is the human body posed to support a specific interaction. These are the object affordances, and I'll say more about that as we go on. And uh, also in detecting what you might call in analogy with proteins, the active sites of objects. That is, where are the places where a human interacts with the object? And objects have designed often to have very specific interactors, like a button to push on and on, a lever to turn, a handle to pull, and so on. And so being able to detect and understand the semantics of these object parts is an important part of this project. So, so the overall goal is to uh, capture detailed information about how objects you know, interact with humans and also objects and objects and encode more than just a key world. Talk about the physics and the dynamics of the interaction and build a vocabulary of elementary actions out of which more complex plans can be put together. 
In some sense, the high-level goal here is how to digitize human physical skills that involve humans acting by themselves or, or with objects. And uh, as I mentioned, we are more and more interested in encoding the dynamics of the interactions. Uh, here I show a particular effort where we essentially take the moving object and replace it by, by a particle cloud and then look at the statistics of this particle cloud moving as a way to represent what the interaction is. And uh, so we built these descriptors of interactions that allow us to compare and contrast uh, different interactions. So for example, um, if you look in this next uh, slide, you know, a cup can be approached in multiple ways. One is to grasp it by the side, but sometimes if, you know, if it's too hot, we want to grasp it from the top and we want to, you know, to be able to distinguish those two interactions. At the same time, there can be two very different objects, like a bed and a chair, where a human sits on them, even though the geometry of the object is different, the action itself is very similar. And we're going to be able to make this kind of nuanced uh, distinctions. And ultimately, the goal here is to be able to understand what is the human you know, intent and create smart environments where the objects try to make it easier for the human to accomplish what they are trying to accomplish. Uh, one uh, side comment I want to make is uh, part of my work has been on building these networks that transport information between visual data. The idea is that if you have um, you know, similar objects in this case, this notion of similarity can act as a communication channel that transports information and knowledge from one object to the other. And so the goal here is to transport interaction information from one object to the other. Like in classical information theory, the channel you know, is not perfect, the objects are not the same, not everything can be transferred, and it takes some understanding to know how to transfer things and what can be transferred and what not. Uh, the way we build these networks is by establishing maps and correspondences between objects. This can be very detailed. Perhaps you know, if it's the same object in different poses, then of course we can have a point-to-point -point map, but most of the time it's it's a map at a more abstract level, at a more structural level, at the level of parts. And we build these networks that can be used to transport information. And again, we find that networks of, say, 3D models are much easier to deal with because the information is more pure. Or in images, we have to worry about you know, where is the object in the image and not to take into account the other parts and so on. So in general, the philosophy here is that we want to be able to have this repository, extract knowledge from data, and deposit it into the repository so that given some new data, some new video, some, some new image, some new scan, we can now annotate it with this knowledge that lives in, in the cloud through the repository. And uh, so essentially now, this transportation mechanism becomes an annotation mechanism for new data, and it sort of adds information to, to the signal that may not be there at the beginning. For example, you can take this partial scan of the chair that you see and then you know, complete it because you have an understanding of what chairs like that look like from prior data. So this is the context, and now let me say a few things about some key steps in this pipeline. One is how do you acquire knowledge, and one uh, aspect of that is part knowledge. Um, so I'll show here how we annotated a small part of ShapeNet using a combination of crowdsourcing and algorithmic propagation. So the idea is here that we um, uh, say take chairs as a class of objects. Chairs have certain well-defined parts, for example, a seat. And we ask humans to annotate seats for certain chairs in 2D views of 3D models. And then we have various ways to propagate information to other chairs using many different kinds of transport mechanisms. And in fact, part of this effort is to learn what types of transport mechanisms work best for what types of data. And then all these propagated annotations get verified by humans. So in the end, everything has been human verified before it goes into this repository. So it's a bit, it's a bit like this. You know, there's a human painting where the shade is in this lamp, and there's a few of those throughout the network. And then this information is propagated to similar objects in the network, and then everything gets verified or rejected by humans. And the key aspect here is that the verification is a much, much faster step than the, 
than the annotation, because the annotation means painting on a 3D model, and it's quite slow. Uh, but the verification is just you know, clicking the wrong images, so it all works very fast. And this allows us to, again, minimize the human time spent in this effort and reduce vastly the amount of time needed to annotate. Okay, so now we have some shapes, we have some parts, and here's some examples of the, these are sort of, I mean, these are not very fine, but still they give us lots of you know, nice semantic information about shapes and their parts. And we also looked at how to um, build shapes part by part uh, by adding components one after the other uh, to create a model. This is part of the synthesis part. And uh, so again, this is sort of part assembly. We have a system that tries to recommend components to add to complete the partial assembly. Um, and I show here some sequences of examples. Uh, part of the challenge here is that it, uh, a com you know, completion is a multi-valued function. I mean, given this chair seat, one can add chair backs, one can add you know, chair legs, you know, many parts. So somehow we have to allow this multiplicity of choice in the representation. Uh, so the approach we took has a data processing part, which is actually very significant because it has to do with sort of denoising noisy data, but I will not have time to go into that. And then we build certain networks that create an embedding space where the parts live, from which then we try to select the appropriate parts that complement a given part. And there's another network that actually does the placement of the parts. So, so say, given this uh, chair base in this embedding space, which I'm showing here in a very primitive way as, as one dimensional, this may be a, a complementary part, but there will not be only one, there'll be several. So there will be some, some distribution over this underlying space that we want to learn. And uh, to accomplish this, we use our point net architecture. That's a deep net that's able to process point clouds very efficiently. Point clouds are a bit interesting because it's not possible to apply classical convolutional architectures directly to point clouds because they don't have the regularity that convolutions need. Nevertheless, we, you know, PointNet is very, very lightweight and very effective. I will not have time to go into it right now. So what we do here is we build a joint network that can both embed parts and figure out where the complementary parts to a given part are. I will not have time to go into details, but we use the PointNet architecture for this, and, and we treat everything really as a point cloud and we found that we have to add also not just positive examples, but negative examples, things that are not complementary parts to make this work and tie the weights between the positive and the negative examples. And this creates an architecture that then can be complemented by a placement network that figures out not only sort of what the complementary part is, but where it goes in the shape. And so we can use this for an interactive design. Here's a small example of an animation showing this is you know, 2x faster than normal. Uh, so you can see essentially there are you know, part suggestions that the user then selects and adds to very quickly you know, complete shapes. Um, the whole process can be automated so that essentially from a given part, you can start adding things in multiple ways to create kind of multiple shapes that all contain at this initial part, and that's interesting. So you can see essentially a spectrum of possibilities that you can sort of create starting from a given base. What's also interesting here is that um, the embedding we produce is aware somehow of the semantics of the parts. And what I show here is the nearest neighbors in our embedding to the parts shown on the left and highlighted in red. These are all sort of chair legs for a table and uh, you know, sail winds for the sailboat at the bottom. If you compare what you would get if you use a more traditional embedding based on pure geometric similarity, that would be very different. What I'm showing here, these little numbers that you see at the bottom, like this 1897 or 6486, are, are the ranks of these retrievals in the ordering according to the more traditional geometric metric. And you can see these kind of semantically very similar shapes would be very far as geometric shapes. So somehow, because we understand the complementarity of parts, parts that 
play the same role, even though they're geometrically different, they're semantically similar, but you are able to retrieve parts more on their semantic similarity. And of course, the semantic similarity uh, reflects to the function of the objects, which is my main topic. And capturing function is, uh, is tricky. Here I show some examples of shapes that look perfectly normal locally, but actually they're not functional. There's a fundamental flaw in their design. And so to understand functionality, you must be able to understand why the shapes are wrong. So let me finish by talking about uh, human object you know, interactions how to learn those from video data. And this is a challenging problem because the places where we work and live tend to be complex. We have to, under, you know, to understand objects and actions, and we have to deal with consistency, plausibility, and causality. The approach we have taken is to build a generative model that tries to learn the laws that govern interactions, both in terms of physics and in terms of custom and then create a representation that has two parts, a combinatorial part that focuses on the appropriate sequence of atomic actions that accomplish a given goal, and then more of a continuous part that learns about the actual motions and placements of the objects in physical space. And we do that all from videos, from RGB, not RGBD videos in this case. Let me say a few words about the representation the key representation is the high-level one, what we call action plots. We model interactions as a sequence of atomic actions. Every action can be represented by an action tuple that encodes the object involved, so where you start, where you end, and the duration. And a plot then becomes a sequence of this action tuple. And here is an overview of the system we have built that has a number of modules, starting from the left, you can see the learning component from videos and the extraction of the actual plot present in that video. And that feeds into the generative model that, again, has two components, the actual plot component, which is the overall strategy for accomplishing the goal, and then this Gaussian mixture model that deals with the continuous aspect, the actual as a realization of the grasps, the moves, the placements, and so on, and then the generation of the synthetic interaction. Uh, here's an example of just kind of replicating what we see in the video, so we can synthesize something that just kind of mirrors what we see in an actual video. But I'll show you that we can do a lot more than that. We can synthesize the new videos that look real, even though they have never been seen. Let me talk about how to learn from videos, this involves quite a number of techniques from computer vision, including object detection, hand segmentation, multi-object tracking, and this object state detection that I mentioned at the beginning. Um, for these four parts, we have used mostly off-the-shelf components. I named them in the slide, uh, faster RCNN for object detection, a fully connected network for hand segmentation, uh, kernelized correlation filters, a Hungarian matching for the multi-object tracking, and then um, I use VGG features on an SVM for the object state, and then we developed a new action recognition algorithm that tries to segment the videos into appropriate, appropriate semantic actions. This shows the object detection part, and you can see it's detecting objects and object states. For example, it knows that the cup is empty, it knows that the cell phone is off, it's keeping track of how many oranges are in the bowl and so on. So this is an example of the object detection part of the pipeline. Uh, the action segmentation is actually learned using a rather modest number of videos, only 75 in our case. And uh, as I mentioned, we take video frames and their two neighbors on each side and try to assign an action label to each of them. And then, and then we you know, feed that into an LSTM. And here are some of the examples, actions, that we detect shown on the bottom with colors and labels. And uh, here's an example of the action segmentation that we can do. Uh, here, the uh, top of each interaction is the ground truth. 
where the colors indicate the actual action taken and the bottom is the prediction. And you can see they are fairly close. On the left, we have the scores on a frame by frame, frame accuracy. On the right is the scores in terms of, of a higher representation of the combinatorial sequence of actions that are taken. And you can see those scores are very, very good. So you, have, so you can understand somehow the sequencing of the types of actions that, that take place. And then there's a continuous part that tries to realize this combinatorial structure into actual motions. So for example, to predict where an object will be placed, we have to know where the object starts. We have to know the arrangement of other objects near that object and the speed by which it moves. And then we can make predictions, make a distribution about where the object might land. So using all that, now we can go to the generative model, which, as I mentioned, factorizes the action plot into these two components, the action plot, the high-level sequence of actions, and then the object mo motion model. So there is the discrete part and the continuous part. And the basic structure here is a, is a recursive net based on these gated recursive units, uh, the GRU shown there, where you feed it the action of the previous step, the duration, the object state, the active object, and the action label, and it predicts the action for the next time step. And that's an example where the blue part is what was fed in as input, and the red is what comes out in the end. And we try to evaluate the quality of this according to how well the generated actions obey various physical laws and other conventions about objects. For example, if you are holding some object, you cannot also hold some other object at the same time. If you're going to pour water from a bottle to a cup, you have to place the bottle over the cup and so on. And uh, here's an example of an error where essentially the network generated something where it, it, it asks to pick up an object without first going to the location of the object. Nevertheless, we found the error rate is quite small. Essentially, 1% of the frames that we generate have a problem like that. So let me show you now some applications of this for training, instructions, smart environments, and home robots. Here you see this uh, the synthesis that I mentioned earlier. Um, you can see that you can reconstruct, but also generate essentially the same actions, but in a different environment. In, uh, actually here it's the same, but the object <laughs> have been moved around. But you can also move it to different scenes, so the network is able to, you know, to to understand there's you know, other objects and they have to be avoided. There can be kind of no collisions. You have to find the object that you want and so on. Uh, here you can show different continuations of the same interaction, how the future might evolve given a partial video that you start with. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm going a little bit fast now because I'm running out of time. Um, so here I show again on the top, you see the actual video. On the bottom is the reconstruction. And the, I mean, the second row is the reconstruction. And the other two are, are generated interactions that are plausible continuations of an initial part of this video. We also looked at a small kind of real experiment where we have this cup that's sitting on a, oh, on a robotic platform. And here, the user moves away. And the cup goes to a canonical position. Here, the user extends the hand, and the cup comes to the user. Here, the user does, you know, grabs the bottle, and then the cup comes, comes to the user. Uh, so again, this is to show that it's possible to, you know, to infer intent and have an environment that is smart and responds to the user. OK, uh, let me finish by uh, talking just uh, for a minute about some future directions and challenges in this work. Uh, we've had always this challenge of how to get training data for these algorithms. This shows an experiment where we used an Oculus to have a user look at virtual objects, try to grasp them with the real hand, and then acquire data from the real hand using a 3D scanner. We are also, also have built this, uh, this hand rig with four cameras, try to capture hand interactions from a you know, hand-centric point of view. Uh, so we can see what's going on from, uh, you know, from up close. We uh, are building new data sets that combine multiple extra data sets. For example, the some CG data of indoor scenes with the shape net objects added 
so we can have complex environments with interactions. We are looking at simulators as a way to generate uh, a training data. And I wish I had more time to speak about that, but I don't. And so in the end, we want to be able to have combined understanding of both the, the objects and the hand to, you know, to fully capture the interactions. So again, the ultimate goal of this is one, is to understand and digitize uh, human physical skills and uh, to create assistance that can help us in our daily tasks using 3D as the base. So I'm going to stop here, and I want to thank the students and postdocs who work on this project, also my senior collaborators, as well as uh, the uh, companies and agencies that have funded this work. Thank you. Well, the, the, the challenge in the simulation setting is always this. Uh, is the simulation sufficiently close to the real world so that what you learn from simulations can be applied to the real world? We have a lot of experience on that front from ShapeNet uh, because, in fact, one of the main uses of ShapeNet has been to generate synthetic data for training computer vision algorithms. And our experience there is this. When, you, when, you, when what you are trying to learn is a low-dimensional geometric quantity, for example, the pose of an object. Then learning from synthetic data does work very, very well. It is less good when you're trying to learn some more abstract semantic aspect of the object. But uh, for a lot of things, like, uh, like pose estimation, both for, both for rigid objects and for humans, we found that training based on synthetic data is actually uh, uh, very effective. Now, another direction we are trying to pursue is perhaps there can be other ways to benefit from uh, synthetic data that are not simply to generate you know, photorealistic imagery, meaning to map the, the, the animation that you generate, the interaction, into some more abstract representation, but at the same time be able to take the real data and lift them into the same space. And then you can do the training and the learning in this lower dimensional abstract space. And we're exploring some directions along uh, that axis as well. Um, very great uh, system and a very good talk. Um, I have a quick question. So most of your system has been a vision-based uh, yes. system. And then have you taken into consideration of picking up an object with resistance, you know, physical kind of interaction? So do you, do you anticipate to, you know, collab, you know, collaborate on that perspective in the future? Yeah, thank you. Very good question. Because, of course, the way that, that we as humans can know the world is not just through our eyes, but also through our touch, through our senses. Um, we have your proposals uh, along this line, where the idea is, Essentially, you are trying to learn by probing the object. So, you know, like we say, how do you grasp something? I mean, you can, you know, there can be a shape net of grasps, right? You can have grasp information and transfer it to a new object. But it's not perfect because you have to understand the weight of, your, of the object and the weight distribution. And then somehow, and the notion is you start interacting with the object in a way that balances getting new information and getting the task done. And so you want to be able to do that in, in actual times, sort of real time. So essentially, you, you try to interact, learn, and adapt it, uh, uh, have to interact with what you've learned as you touch the object. So you kind of interact with the real world and then see how the feedback would be in real right. time, and then you learn from that interaction. Right. That's right. very cool. All right, thank you.